Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Good evening and welcome to another episode of The Review, the show where we examine contemporary issues that affect the Muslim community both here and, of course, around the world. Now, this November, we are dedicating The Review to the pressing subject of Islamophobia and our awareness of it. After all, this is, of course, Islamophobia Awareness Month, so no better time to take a look and some in-depth looks at this issue. Tonight, I'm going to be joined by academics and experts in their field to discuss the subject further. Uh, we're going to be looking at various issues around Islamophobia, focusing on its impact and implications specifically tonight as it pertains to those of us who are here in the UK. Right, uh, for the first half of our show tonight, I'm going to be joined by Lindsay Taylor. I'll be joined by Haris Mohammed and, of course, by Basit Mahmoud. Looking ahead to the second half, we're going to be joined by Afsal Khan MP, Tabitha Bati, and Dr. Fatima Khan. So let us begin. And may I start with a very short film about some of the issues we've been dealing with before I come back to our guests. The number of anti-Muslim incidents reported in the UK increased to roughly seven a week after the Christchurch terror attack in New Zealand in 2019. We believe that 40 people have lost their lives in this act of extreme violence. Ten have died at Linwood Avenue Mosque, three of which were outside the mosque itself. A further 30 have been killed at Dean's Avenue Mosque. With reports of Islamophobic hate crime rising in the UK over the last decade, communities are looking to take control of the situation and diffuse tensions by articulating what constitutes Islamophobia and by understanding its rise. The UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia and Related Intolerance defines Islamophobia as a baseless hostility and fear of Islam and as a result, a fear of and aversion towards all Muslims or the majority of them. Are the hate crimes being reported part of a worrying trend or is the UK, as some say, still the best place to be a Muslim in Europe. How can Muslims tackle the issue? And what can different communities do to counter its rise? We find out here on The Review. Welcome back indeed. Some pressing issues, as you can see there. Well, if I'd like to introduce my guests, uh, Lindsay Taylor is the regional manager for the Muslim Engagement and Development, which is, of course, MEND uh, in Scotland. Haris Mohammed, he is a long-term MEND volunteer who specializes in data and media. And Basit Mahmoud is a former journalist with the Metro newspaper who took a change of direction in his career specifically to address Islamophobia and the misinterpretation or misrepresentation of Muslims in the media. He's currently working at Newsweek International. Uh, Salaam alaikum and welcome to all three of you. Welcome, Salaam. Thank you very much for joining us. Guys, I'd like to begin by what is quite a simple question. And if I could perhaps start with you, Lindsay. You know, when we talk about the term Islamophobia, and I'll be, I'll be putting this to each of you, what, what does that mean to you? What does it mean? Because it is a, it, it, it can be a vague term. People have different understandings of it. Um, when you, you're somebody who works at MEN, you're somebody who's at the cutting edge of dealing with this, what does the term mean to you specifically? So the term to me specifically, it means quite a lot of different things. It means, it means hatred of Muslims, it means discrimination, it means marginalization, it means a whole host of different things. Now, obviously there's the, all-party um, definition that has been accepted by some, but not all um, across the UK. So that's very simply Islamophobia is rooted in racism and is a type of racism that targets expression of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. Now, that is a definition that works on a lot of levels, but also it, it doesn't highlight the real crux of Islamophobia in some cases. Being that a lot of people think that Islamophobia should not be a term and instead it should be anti-Muslim hatred. But Islamophobia goes much deeper into the issue. Anti-Muslim hatred is just the criminal act, it's just the hate crime act, verbal and physical attacks, whereas Islamophobia goes deep down, it goes into employment, it goes into um, 
stereotypes, it goes into institutionalised racism and Islamophobia, right. it goes into so many different things. So yeah. to me, Islamophobia is an all-encompassing all -encompassing. discrimination and hatred towards Muslims. So it's interesting that you see it as, as more than anti-Muslim hatred. Basit, if I could bring you in there, what, what do you understand? Anything more that you can embellish on what, on what Lindsay has brought? I mean, I agree with the argument that the idea that it um, helps express Muslims as well, because, but at the same time, also we can homogenize it to make us feel that we're a monopoly that's responsible for, or all think alike, and are all responsible for certain acts and issues. But at the same time, I think it's important that one of the things I've come to learn over the last two years since I've been a journalist, but also longer term, is these debates around what is Islamophobia, and, and it's important that we clarify it as well. But the, the semantics that are played by certain people within the media or within uh, certain lobby groups who basically try and I think it's a distraction for them to try and define Islam, because at the end of the day, they know Islamophobia isn't just an abstract term. It leads to increases in hate crimes against Muslim women on the streets. It leads, it leads to, you know, you look at the prevent scheme, the criticisms with that, and, and you know, criminalizing legitimate forms of dissent. So it's not, when, when, when they keep saying, you know, and I find it interesting that we're always having this discussion, I think that plays into the hands sometimes of, you know, when we're trying to define Islamophobia, what is Islamophobia? It's one of those unique types of racism where, we're spending more time t trying to prove that it exists, even though the statistics show that it exists. You know, genocides are increasing, and that's a fact. Even the UN accused, you know, Facebook of not doing enough to tackle uh, Islamophobia. But at the same time, I think I think it's important, incredibly important, to make sure that we we don't fall into that trap of having this parallel conversation of while people are experiencing abuse and humiliation and degradation, we're kind of debating the term all the time because I think that empowers the people who, are, who in actual fact, are the Islamophobes. Okay, so Lindsay talking about it being a more inclusive term, you're talking about the importance of whilst we're arguing about the definition, not missing out the actual impact of it. Uh, if I could come to you, Harris, what's your understanding? How, how important do you feel, rather, how understood do you feel the term Islamophobia as a term is within the Muslim community first and then really within the wider non-Muslim community? Um, yeah, I 100% agree with what's been said previously. And just to build on top of that, actually, I think that's why things like Islamophobia Awareness Month are so important, just because there's this perception of what Islamophobia is and this idea that it's this vague term or this vague bias that exists, where in actuality it's affecting people on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. And the, the truth of the matter is it, it can affect... Uh, and it's the type of it affects every type of Muslim as well. Um, like it's been previously stated, it's, uh, Muslims aren't a homogenous monolith. Um, different type of Muslim exist with different levels of practice, who come from a variety of different um, countries. Uh, some of them are born Muslim, some of them are reverts or converts. Yeah. Uh, some of them live in majority Muslim areas. Some of them live in minority Muslim areas, where there's they may be the only Muslim family in that in that uh, town or village. And man, uh, Islamophobia manifests itself differently for each of those individual people. So I think it's important to recognise that Islamophobia can affect different people in different ways. And the intensity or the, the grade of which that Islamophobia affects people is, is wide and varied. Um, therefore, raising uh, awareness of Islamophobia as an issue, both within the Muslim community and out, uh, the wider community, is important because people will undergo some kind of yeah. it could be a small incident and not necessarily realize that actually that incident was in itself rooted within Islamophobia. It was. Harris, on, on that particular point, I mean, you, you, you talk about the issue of trying to uh, understand Islamophobia, it's, it, what, what's rooted, where it's rooted, and the fact that we, you know, we, we can talk about definitions, but this is a very, very real thing. Do you feel that our community, that the Muslim community themselves, they, do you think that they themselves understand when they're being victims of Islamophobia? Do you think it has, has subtleties, really, that our own community don't understand? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, for for the majority of Muslims in the UK, um, they do tend to come from different ethnic backgrounds, and therefore sometimes those that abuse can become conflated, be it be, uh, due to um, black racism or Pakistani racism yeah. or racism of the Asian variety. Those two things can become conflated sometimes, and because some uh, elements of society believe that. That, that racism is based in ignorance and almost is part and parcel of living as a minority community in a where they are the minority, 
they may not necessarily be able to identify the factors which point out, actually, no, do you want this abuse isn't just based in racism, but it's yeah. in fact based in Islamophobia. Yeah. And I think sometimes a lack of education means that we are unable to identify and clarify that. Yeah, the fact that, um, Lindsay, the fact that we as a Muslim community are not one race, as, as Harris was talking about, the fact that we are, some of us are converts or reverts to the faith, some of us are European, some of us are, are from the Far East, some of, I mean, I, I know many people are often very surprised, my non-Muslim colleagues, when you say to them, actually, the majority of Muslims of the world live in the Far East. They always have this uh, idea that Muslims are either, either Pakistani or Arabs. Um, do you think that's part of the problem that we've had as a community and in defining it ourselves and in having a definition recognised that, that we are quite sort of diverse in our backgrounds. It's not as easy as saying you are just a race of people and therefore this race of people, any discrimination against them is clearly defined as Islamophobia. Do you know, I think that you can definitely be right. Um, I myself am a revert, um, although quite a lot of the Islamophobia experiences that I have had myself have an element of race wrapped up, wrapped up to it. My husband as well, he's from West Africa, he's from Ivory Coast. Right. But his Islamophobia, the, what he's experienced, can also be slightly different from what I myself or what South Asian friends have experienced. It does all have a very different element. And I think, yep, that can definitely be an issue. And I think it's about defining Islamophobia as 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 a discrimination because we are Muslim. Mm. And yes, there is definitely the element of, ra of race and that needs to be incorporated yeah. into it. But we need to look at the, the deeper problem. We need to look at the deeper issue that's going on here. And that's the fact that Muslims, regardless of where they're from, are suffering Islamophobia. They're, dis yeah. they're suffering from discrimination, from hate crime, from attacks, because of their religion, because of their faith and their belief. And it shouldn't come into it and it shouldn't matter where we're from. There is obviously the race element, but we need to look at it as purely Islamophobia because of our faith and beliefs. Because of our faith and beliefs. If I could bring that over to you, Basit. Um, it's interesting that every, all three of you talked about the kind of whether or not or, or how we're defining it, the grassroots reality of it, the, the impact that it's having on people and on their lives. And as I said, Basit, if I could ask you, and I'm going to ask the others as well, an example that you could bring to our viewers of something that you would define as blatant Islamophobia that perhaps is as, as Baron has vastly put it, past the dinner table test. Something that is almost acceptable in community, in the wider community, and yet it is absolutely black and white, clear Islamophobia. It, it is a prejudice against people because of their uh, religious faith. I mean, a clear cut example would be after the French terror attacks in, I think, 2015, the first Charlie Hebdo, I got asked the next day, you know, what do you think about that? I mean, it's pretty clear that, the, you know, it's like, uh, you know, uh, what do you make of that? And no one else gets asked in the office. Yeah. I mean, it's clear that they're specifically asking me that question and asking me, you know, like, you know, no one would ask, you know, white people after the attack by Brevik, um, you know, what do you think about that? Um, or, I mean, a more blatant example is when my mum was abused on the street. I mean, that because of her headscarf, that's obviously in your face. But those are physical examples of Islamophobia. There's structural examples of Islamophobia as well. So, for example, you've got the closing of uh, bank accounts of charities. Yeah. Uh, Peter Oborn's written about that. It's not something that's niche or conspiratorial. You know, normal Muslim charities have nothing to do with extremism, having their bank accounts closed um, for no apparent reason whatsoever. Um, that's what's not up to me. But I think th this is one point that I just want to pick up on that Lindsay made, that, and I think this is important, because this debate around semantics, you know, the most common argument you'll always hear is that I can't be racist, Muslims aren't a race. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. that doesn't stop Muslims being racialized. So, for example, when you're looking to stop people at an airport, you're looking for someone with a particular name who looks a certain way. Yeah. But the point why the original definition of Islamophobia target mentioned expressions of Muslims, and this is a key point, if Muslimness or perceived Muslimness, if Islamophobia wasn't racism, why is it that Sikhs get attacked for being Muslim? Yeah. I mean, Sikhs get attacked for being Muslim. And, you know, it's got nothing to do with the ideology. No one asks them about the ideology when they get yeah. attacked. It's everything to do with racialization. And the first person to be killed after 9-11 in a hate crime was a Sikh man by someone who wanted to kill Muslims. Yeah. So I, believe he was a, I believe he was a taxi driver, wasn't he? Yeah. So I yeah. think it's important. You know, with, I think one of the things that we've forgotten, just bringing this across as a journalist, is that yeah, only 0.4% of journalists are Muslim. Now, wow. the, look, I'm going to be totally honest. When I have, you know, relatives or whoever, when I told them I wanted to be a journalist, looked at me like, what? 
<laughs> but it's, you know, and a lot of young Muslims come to me with that exact same, uh, you know, that we want to go into the media, but our community or our parents don't think it's a worthwhile uh, profession. It's the second most socially exclusive profession in the country. There's yeah. clearly something to, that, that's there that other communities engage with. We're woefully underrepresented. And I think it's important that we, we engage with it. We also need to forget that we have a structural barrier, whether it's defining Islamophobia or getting involved with the media and understanding what these terms are. Yeah. 46% of the Muslim community live in the 10 poorest local authority areas in the country. Yeah. No one wants to talk about the poverty in, in the UK that affects Muslim people. It's always through the lens of extremism, radicalization, but no one thinks for a second, hang on, if we tackle some of the poverty, yeah. maybe we'll remove some of the barriers that we're look, so keen to. Look at to some of these core issues, that's right. If I could, if I could bring the original question there back to, um, to Harris and to Lindsay. Um, if, uh, if, if Harris, if you could think of a, 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 a shining example, or maybe I shouldn't use the word shining, glaring example of Islamophobia that people would be quite surprised maybe that's happening every day and yet we just carry on and, and effectively we see that the mainstream media, a very, very little coverage of what would be, if it was targeted at other minority groups, could potentially make headlines? Yeah, um, absolutely. So I think uh, social media is probably a, like I said, you don't necessarily use the word shining example, but a glaring example of how with the popularization of social media and the ability for everyone to have a voice, yeah. um, it, uh, Islamophobic comments are passed uh, almost on a daily basis and are increasing, unfortunately. But you'd be surprised to hear that a former UKIP councillor in Stourport, Worcestershire, um, actually posted a very, very Islamophobic uh, image uh, with uh, a representation of what would be perceived to be Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the Quran being burned and a, a, a pig-like character roasting that... Uh, that um, perceived uh, perception of characterization of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he wasn't found guilty of it uh, in in any court of law um, mm -hmm. he was simply asked was it your intention to to inspire um, religious hatred and he said no it wasn't my intention I was simply expressing my uh, uh, freedom of speech and he wasn't found guilty of, uh, of that incident yeah. and and incidents like that happen on a daily basis, but the fact that, and we heard Boris Johnson a couple of years ago talk about women, women who wear the niqab as um, letterboxes and ninjas, yeah. the, the fact that um, politicians who are in who hold the, currently have the highest office in the land, what that does is that almost legitimizes that opinion for then fringe groups to then think, well, actually, if Boris Johnson, who's currently the prime minister, can express such an opinion, then so can I. Um, exactly, and I, yeah. And it's it's scarier and it is, it is indeed. And I, I, you remind me, actually, of um, the political commentator James O'Brien, who, in a very, very powerful uh, short piece that he did to camera, which, which went viral a couple of years ago, where he yeah. substituted the word Muslim for other races and other religions. And he just yeah. took out the word Muslim and he put other races, other religions in there. And immediately, you, you were actually shocked. You were genuinely shocked that somebody could say that about another faith. And yet you see that these are, these are mainstream headlines. If I, if I can... Bring that over to you, Lindsay. As a as a as a practicing Muslim woman, and obviously the, our, our sisters who wear the headscarf are more easily identifiable as as being Muslim. They they're certainly less able to be camouflaged within wider mainstream society. Do, have you yourself been a victim of of blatant Islamophobia just because people have made assumptions purely on the way that you look and dress? Do you know, definitely. Unfortunately, um, a lot of female Muslims that I know have and. But yes, I myself have been a victim of Islamophobia out in the streets in Scotland, which a lot of people are really shocked about. Um, but going back to the kind of racial issue, when, when I have suffered Islamophobic attacks, there have been that racial aspect of it. Um, I was once, uh, I was walking down the street in a small town just outside Glasgow, and a guy came up to me and started screaming in my face to go home, calling me a terrorist, swearing at me. You know, highlighting that I was somebody of a different religion and different uh, different ethnicity and, and all this kind of stuff. And and really, it was the first time actually in my life I thought in the street, I'm going to get punched here. Wow. That's that's how it felt. I thought I was actually physically going to be hit and, by him. And are you are you born and bred in Scotland? Are you are you kind of are you <laughs> thoroughbred Scottish? Thoroughbred, well, a bit <laughs> Irish, a little bit English, bit of, bit of everything. But but yeah, I'm born and bred in Scotland. Can trace yeah. my heritage back for many generations. Yeah. Um, but still, but still faced Islamophobia and still had it racialized. So, yeah, there's definitely the racial aspect of it. But as the others have highlighted, 
the fact that we're taking so much time arguing or discussing the semantics means that Islamophobia is allowed to carry on. The fact that people can't pinpoint a definition and that it's not been accepted across the board in all local authorities, in all governments, yeah. in all yeah. political yeah. parties means that it's allowed to carry on and this kind of abuse is allowed to happen on a daily basis. I'd like to move it on a bit if I can and I'd like to start with you, Bartit, um, you, uh, uh, working as a journalist. This, this um, you know, as a Muslim community, there's no doubt that we feel the pressure in the media of Islamophobia. We feel that we are misrepresented. We feel that parts of the media don't portray us in, in a fair light. I think most Muslims would, would find some sympathy with that statement. Do you feel that this stems from ignorance? That it's just about not understanding and that it's our job as a community to communicate more and to, to you know, to have more uh, interlocutors with the wider community? Or do you think that for perhaps from parts of the media, there may be an agenda to portray Muslims in a certain light? I think, I mean, I've been a journalist for two years and I'm And one thing I can say is that this is an industry that's 94% white. It's less than 11% come from working class backgrounds. Uh, less than 0.3%, so 0.3% journalists are black, 0.4% Muslim. So clearly there's a diversity issue. As with anything, if you're in a bubble or an echo chamber or um, you're, you're kind of giving in to this kind of groupthink mentality, a, a lot of journalists, for example, may not. I mean, from my own experience, I've met people who, you know, I was the first Muslim they ever met. In, and on some occasions, you'll probably be the only Muslim if you are in the newsroom on the news desk. Mm -hmm. um, so there's sometimes there's genuine lack of understanding and there's brilliant journalists out there who do want to do more and yeah. you know another centre for media monitoring that the Muslim Council of Britain set up they work closely with a lot of these journalists and they've turned up but I think um, but the other thing is you've also also got to look at it a different now I know that there's some newsrooms for example that exist that uh, they reward bonuses to their uh, journalists based on how many unique views and clicks they can get right so right. if you take that model um, what, what does that encourage them that encourages sensationalism that encourages division, and it's a race to the bottom. Clickbait headlines that aren't yeah. true. I'm yeah. not going to stand here and say, you know, because you know, I'd, I'd be lying if I said that I didn't think there was a bigotry blind spot within sections of the media when it came to Islamophobia. I mean, of course there is. A lot of journalists didn't even report the fact that, for example, conservative the hope not hate report that came out. A lot of newspapers ignored it. That basically, you know, you've had conservative party members talking about forget. I mean, just put it bluntly, they're talking about sterilizing Muslims, throwing, throwing them off bridges, uh, you know, mosques to be banned. Some of those members got let back in. Hardly any newspapers reported it. Um, so yeah, let's not pretend that there isn't a bigotry blind spot. Uh, and what I mean, again, drawing on Centre for Media Monitoring research, over half of stories that reported on terror, terrorism, or terrorist related incidents referred to Muslims. But, uh, you know, that's nine times as much as they refer to far-right neo-Nazi groups, right. who, believe it or not, I don't know if people still don't understand, are behind most terrorist attacks, for example, in the US, and they're a growing threat. So I think there is, so to answer back to your question, there's, there's ignorance, but at the same time, there's, there's some newspapers who I genuinely think when it comes to Muslims, I mean, and again, this is a fact, there's, you know, you've seen inaccurate stories uh, published about Muslims on the front pages, and nothing really happens. So. Yeah. There is, there is ignorance, but there's also a chase for clicks and profit, yeah. and that links into profit margins. That sort of clickbait, and I know I've seen that myself. I, I, in fact, um, I, I drew attention to an issue recently in a, in a national newspaper where they were talking about the spread of COVID, uh, and they had a Muslim family on the front. There was a Muslim family, a, a woman in hijab, her two or three children, a man with a beard. The issue had nothing to do with Muslims, except it was talking about the epidemic and the spread of COVID throughout the country. You know, looking at one of the smallest minorities in the country, and yet that was the picture that they chose to run the story with. Harris, if I could bring that to you. I mean, look, MEND have, have a, a department which, which specifically tries to hold the media to account. And we've heard uh, Bassett talking about some examples. What sort of issues are MEND dealing, you know, head on? In in terms of calling the media to account, where they have perhaps, uh, as, as Bassett said, where there's a blind spot, and who knows, perhaps maybe there may be some intentional clickbait in there to, to misrepresent a situation. What are men doing to, to call them to account? Um, well, obviously we're trying to raise awareness of the fact that people can complain, but also how you can complain making sure that you're speaking to the right regulatory body, mm. making sure you uh, uh, report the um, inaccuracy or 
but the sensationalized or the lie uh, in the correct format. Uh, Mend has a online toolkit, uh, the media toolkit, which actually explains to you how you go about uh, com uh, making these complaints to Ofcom or to any other regulator about something that you've seen. Yeah. But just to kind of go, go off the back of what Bassett said, obviously, um, specializing in data, we talked about um, social media and the way the monetary model of social media works, it's all about clicks and views. Therefore, anything that you can do to maybe sensationalize your post or have something attention grabbing on your post that's maybe going to entice someone to click or to or to look at your article in more depth. Social media is, is a massive game in the sense that there's so many other um, industries that you're competing with. So therefore, to make sure that your user clicks on your link or on your picture, you've got to do something that's going to um, grab their attention. And unfortunately, the one of the most easy grabbing attention uh, topics that you can talk about is the um, the pointing out of Muslims in, in a negative light. Um, yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned the COVID example because there's been two or three different examples from different outlets for the media who have had uh, mentions of COVID and it'll be there'll be two Muslim nurses wearing a hijab and there'll be uh, a COVID headline. And so what, subtly sometimes they're constantly this agenda of let's, do something to put Muslims in a negative light in the back of someone, not necessarily explicitly, but sometimes subliminally, just so that the next time they think of a Muslim, there's some negative association. Mm. The study was actually done by Lancaster University yeah. that explained that for every one mention, uh, one positive mention of Muslims in Islam, there are 21 negative mentions. 21? 21. 21. So it's a 21 to 1 ratio. 21 to the, 1 ratio. Between the years of 2010 and 2014. And, and what, what happens is that when there's negative associations constantly coming up, yeah. when as soon as you see a Muslim, we talked about the roots of Islamophobia, that's one of the roots. Yeah. Because you're immediately thought, when you see a Muslim, or when you hear a mention of Islam, your mind is automatically going to go to one of those 21 negative words. Yeah, it's, fun, so, it's, fun, it's funny you say that, because I, I remember uh, I, used to, I used to work on a, on, a, on a DAO store where we used to, you know, talk to the public about issues to do with Islam. And I remember uh, an, an elderly gentleman coming up to me after the 9-11 atrocities and saying to me, he said, you know, he said, the best thing that you guys have got, he said, is your one-to-one -one interaction with non-Muslims. He said, because what we're getting from the media, he said, is never represents who we know from the corner shop, who we know from the cab office, who we know from our local businesses, who we work with, who are colleagues. They're all Muslims. And he yeah. said each, each of us have that responsibility and each of us have that power to show, you know, the genuine face of Islam rather than allowing it to be controlled by just what people see in the media. If I could, if I could come to you, um, uh, Lindsay, how effective is it if we, as a community, because there'll be many people watching now who think that organisations like MEND or MCB or journalists like Barsit, that it's, it's your job to highlight Islamophobia. It's your job to call out the newspapers. But how effective can the public be? The general Muslim community in the UK going around their daily lives, they're not involved in journalism, they're not involved in men, they're not involved in MCB, any of these organisations. In terms of them complaining, of them writing in, of them making their dissatisfaction felt about the way Muslims are being represented, how effective can that be, Lindsay? Do you know, it's not just the Muslim ministry whose job it is to tackle this. It's everybody's job. It's everybody's job to tackle hate in all forms, and yeah. that's really important. So if everybody steps up and has awareness and starts to come together to tackle this, then their voice could be massive. And right now, the Muslim voice can be really effective in tackling the media uh, perception of Muslims or tackling anyone's perception of Muslims by highlighting the issues, by putting in those complaints, by having those, you know, four, five, six hundred complaints coming across editors' desks, that's going to make a difference. And, that's, and you're just sorry, having sorry, one or two... Sorry, to, sorry, to, interrupt, sorry right. to interrupt you, Lindsay, there, but just on that point, does that make a difference? Because I think many people will feel, what, what is my complaint going to do? But when we get complaints that maybe, you know, the, uh, to, a, to a major news organisation, if they get 100 or 200 or 300 complaints about a particular issue, are those editors going to stand up? Are they going to notice that's those sorts of numbers? 
Do you know, they are. A lot of people think, oh, they won't notice just a few hundred or they won't notice just a few, but actually they do. So long as the complaint is put in appropriately, yeah. and as it's been highlighted by Harris, you know, there's mechanisms and it's highlighted on the MEND website and other websites as well, how to put in a proper complaint. So long as it's yeah. done properly and you're highlighting the breaches that have occurred and the breaches that are going on, then yes, they do. Even small numbers, they take, they take attention of because... Right. They have an obligation and they're also governed under certain rules and regulations that they have to abide by. And if they're breaching them and that's highlighted, then they have to take notice and they have to take action underneath those breaches. I think it's really, that's I think that's a really, really important point for our viewers, because I know I know from my family, I know from my own community that there's you know, everyone is is absolutely horrified about the way uh, an issue has been represented. But everyone's like, oh, what can we do? What can we do about it? What, what, what's my complaint going to make? What difference is me if I write in how? But actually, if if just, you know, sometimes a handful, maybe 20, 50, 100 people from a population of what we're, we're nearly, you know, 2 million in this country, you know, if they if a handful of people write in, it will make a difference, won't it? It will. It really will make a difference. Yeah, sorry. sorry I was just giving an example there. Um, yeah. A couple of years ago, a headline was released on the BBC News website that mentioned West Bank uh, attacks on UK envoys. And men, through their app and through their social media, raised awareness of this and uh, complained to the, uh, the the press regulator, the online press regulator. Right. And we have, we have to remember that these press com uh, in complaints, it may say through 200 or 300 or 400, but they, at the end of the day, they are individual people. So nobody, nobody should ever not value their individual complaint. And within six hours, the headline was corrected on the BBC News website to say Israeli settlers attack UK envoys rather than West Bank. Right. So I don't think anyone right. can ever not value their complaint. I think as soon as you are aware of something or you see something, I think you should take it upon yourself as a personal responsibility uh, to say, have I done what I can do? Let's not worry about what everyone else is doing. Let's not make sure if, if nobody's taking responsibility, then that's fine. At least with uh, a clear conscience, you can say, do you know what? I did my bit, and then, inshallah, if everyone, if every individual thinks like that, then we can realise change. And like we said uh, in the example I gave, BBC News changed their headline within just within six hours right. due to the number of individual complaints that came through. I mean, that, that's a crystal clear example, isn't it? It really is of of the impact that we can have as a community if we, as you said, if we as individuals say, well, at least I'm going to do something. I'm going to do Absolutely. something about this. And and that brings me on nicely, actually, onto uh, uh, another question. Look, you know. There are organizations, there is MCB, there's MEN, there are other organizations that are now starting to galvanize community support so that we are lobbying the media, we are lobbying uh, politicians, we are trying to make our voices heard. Who do we look at? Is it, is it our Jewish brothers and sisters and the excellent job that they've done in lobbying against uh, anti-Semitism? Is it the, perhaps the LGBT community who most of us have seen in our lifetime, the, the incredible success that they've had in raising issues to do with LGBT rights? Um, who do we look at as, as examples of what we can do as a Muslim community to make our valid concerns heard where it needs to be heard? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't address that to any of you. If I could come to Barset with that first. Yeah, I mean, just very quickly off that last part, I think, who do we look at? I mean, look, uh, COVID-19, again, it didn't surprise me Islamophobia went up, right? And the reason being is, for example, Jewish communities have always historically been blamed, conspiracy theories have blamed Jewish communities for, for viruses and pandemics. Um, and, and even in this pandemic, you know, Muslims and Jewish communities have, have a very common struggle to, you know, a common kind of... Uh, threat from the far right and fighting against back against those narratives. So, so I think we're more successful if we build coalitions with people, if we yeah. build co coalitions, some of the groups that you mentioned. Uh, but at the same time, we've got to also acknowledge that the challenges we face are unique uh, in the sense that we don't, you know, it's this, the, there's a structural level of Islamophobia post 9-11 that, for example, has dehumanized Muslims. Uh, and believe it or not, I was saying, uh, one of the things that I want to make clear is, yeah, look at those other groups, work with them, you know, of course, but also recognize that we face a unique challenge uh, and also you know I was in a newsroom once and you know a long time ago not in my current newsroom but uh, th there was a there was a thing that came in and someone was about to write the story this journalist was very well intentioned and they lifted the wire copy for example and it's the wire copy was about Anjum Chowdhury okay fine he's released from prison uh, in that copy it said he went to McDonald's okay and then it said and for example Muslims aren't allowed to go to McDonald's 
Now, right. that was written by a press agency. Right. As a Muslim within that newsroom, I was able to pick that up and change that. So yeah. certainly change does happen. Uh, I don't believe in this fatalistic. And I get told all the time, you know, nothing's going to change. But I don't, I mean, do we really need to also look at other groups? Malcolm X was talking about how the media was the most powerful weapon on earth, mm. you know, many years ago. Um, and I think, you know, the solutions are there for us. And I, I always know that hopelessness, and I've always said this, hopelessness is considered a sin in Islam. And to basically say that I'm just going to be hopeless and nothing's going to change. But at the same time, we have to ask ourselves as a community, what have we done uh, to, you know, set up scholarships and push more young British Muslim men and women, especially with the brunt of Islamophobia, into becoming journalists. Muslims are the most charitable, uh, you know, religious group in the country. Uh, I think yeah. studies have shown that. Uh, but when, when I say to people, oh, why don't we invest in lobbying or newspapers? like, what? Why would I do that? Yeah, I mean, that's a really, really good point. Muslims are the most generous. And as, as somebody who has been involved in fundraising in the past, I know that it is very difficult to get people to, to think that, you know, a valid place to put their charity or to give their donations would be towards a group that would be lobbying on behalf of Muslim rights. Harris, if I can ask you, what can we learn? What can we learn from uh, other institutions, other lobbying groups that have been successful in getting their agenda, in getting their valid concerns heard in the right place? Places. Um, so I think there's a two-pronged approach uh, to this, in my own personal opinion. Uh, part of it is being unapologetic. Um, I think sometimes we are not necessarily afraid, but sometimes we shy away from being proud as Muslims, and, and I think we should. I don't think we have anything to be afraid of. Uh, as Bas said, that I think hopelessness is a sin. So we have to be unapologetic. And if you look at other lobbying groups that have had success in recognizing uh, discrimination against them and then subsequently uh, recognizing their legitimacy, uh, uh, they're very unapologetic about who they are and what they believe in. And I think Muslims uh, have to be the same. We have to say, no, do you want? This is, uh, uh, this is Islam, this is Muslims, and this is who we are. Um, as a subsection to that, I think we have to educate ourselves. So when somebody says, oh, well, what does jihad mean? We have to educate ourselves from a, from a religious perspective to at least at a basic level explain, actually, do you know what? The word jihad doesn't mean what you think it means. Let me explain to you. I think that's, that's a huge part of what we do. Mm. And secondly, I think we have to show sympathy and compassion to these causes. Sometimes we, we have maybe a, a preconceived notion that, actually, do you know what? Just because I'm supporting my cause doesn't mean I can support my cause, uh, a different cause. Or do you know what? Um, their cause is their cause and it's not it's nothing to do with me. Well, actually, if we engage with these causes and support these causes uh, as much as we can uh, within our boundaries, then at least we can say, do you know what? Let's engage with these communities. Let's, um, let's, let's engage with... Um, for example, the Jewish community, and help uh, fight discrimination that they're receiving so yeah. that when we're asking for support in uh, against our discrimination, they'll say, do you want this person? He stood up for us. Let me stand up for, the, for them. So I think it's a real wider community effort to yeah. engage with different elements of the community to help that when we do ask for support from an Islamophobic point of view, say, do you know what? This is something that we're suffering from. Somebody else could say, do you know what? They showed compassion to us. Let us show compassion to them. I, 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 I'm, I echo a lot of what you said, and I remember actually attending demonstrations in the past, and at those demonstrations, actually, there were members of the Irish community who, back in the 70s and the 80s, when the word terrorism was mentioned, it was always associated with Irish people, and they'd, they'd gone a long way in understanding how a community can be, you know, tarred with, with one brush, you know, when it, comes to, when it comes to being given a negative portrayal in the media. Um, if I can come back, you were nodding, uh, I noticed, uh, Lindsay, particularly uh, where we spoke about being unapologetic. But when our guest spoke about being unapologetic, when Horace spoke about being unapologetic about who we are, I saw you nodding there, so presumably you agree with that, and I'd like to hear your comments on that. And again, on the wider question, what can we learn from those who've gone before? Yeah, definitely. I think, I think it's one of the issues just now is that Muslims are ashamed to be Muslim because... We have been targeted so much. I know children who go to school and hide the fact that they're Muslim from their classmates because they're so worried about Islamophobia. They're so worried about being othered, being different. And, and we have to stop that. We're Muslim and we should be proud. Islam is a beautiful religion and it's a beautiful faith which is all-encompassing all and it's about loving people and supporting people. And we should accept that and, and stand up for, for our rights and our Islam, you know, because it is a really beautiful religion. And I think also what Harris was saying, you know, um, about working together, that's really important. And also yourself, you know, remembering that Irish communities, 
And that's the thing. So many communities have gone through what we are going through yeah. now. So many yeah. communities we can learn from yeah. because they've been through it. And yeah, definitely, Islamically, it is different. You know, there are there are things that are only um, kind of directed towards the Muslim community that other communities haven't faced before. There is definitely that aspect. But that means that we need to learn from the communities before and draw on their strengths and draw on their support and draw on their understandings. But we also have to understand our own uniqueness and the own and the issues that are facing us uniquely as Muslims and put them together and move forward from that. But to start that, we need to be able to stand up and go, we're Muslim and we're proud of it and we're not going to apologise anymore for simply being Muslim. We need to start leading the conversation instead of chasing behind it. Because right now, that's what we're doing. We're, we're having to constantly answer for, for the mistakes or for the issues or for the Islamophobia. And we're constantly chasing behind a conversation, whereas we need to start leading that conversation. We need to start saying, Islam is a beautiful religion. This is what it can bring to the community. If you're not Muslim, alhamdulillah, that's great. That's yeah. fine. We are, but we can all come together and we can all work together to tackle hate against everybody in a really holistic and really appropriate manner. Well, and that's, that's what's important. That's inspiring words, Lindsay, uh, to draw us this uh, section to an end. Look, I'd like to say thank you to my guests for joining us in this segment. Thank all of you for your excellent work, for your indefatigable attitude and, and fighting the fight uh, for, for what, what Lindsay just summed, summed up, really. It's just against hatred. It's about justice and it's about hatred. And when we fight against justice or when we fight for justice and we fight against hatred, that is for all. That is for all. Yes, it affects us as a Muslim community community, but of course, that affects everybody. So thank you guys, thank you for joining us. After the break, uh, we're going to be looking further into these issues. I'm going to be joined by some more guests. Uh, we're hoping to be joined by Afsal Khan, MP, by Tabitha Bhatti, and by Dr. Fatima Khan. Please.